You know, the rea before we even start, the realities of uh, fixed price. Um, I've been agile since uh, '83, and um, everything I did until about 2000 or '95 or something was all fixed price government contracting. And um, we always finished on time and made our customers happy. And how do we do that? Well, we were agile. So the question is not can you do it. The question is how do you do it. And uh, so that's what we're going to talk about here. But let me tell you, there's no magic to it. Uh, well, no magic to it if my machine works. So far, we haven't tested everything. Okay. So I have to click it here. Oh. For those of you who don't know, my machine blew up this morning. This is a new machine as of yesterday. I've never used System 7 in my life. And uh, I downloaded a copy of this off the cloud from SugarSync about an hour ago. And keep, all of us keep our collective fingers and toes crossed because I have no idea what's going to happen. But what's really going on here, and I don't know why page down doesn't work, who knows. So why it works? Well, what I found out a long time ago is that when you have a collection of features and you do what I would call standard budgeting on the features, which I'll describe, function points, all this ugly stuff that we have forgotten how to do because we're agile. But if you did that stuff, you always had enough money to actually finish on time. But if you did your little, you know, pockets of money, how my coins come? Not too bad. Your little stacks of money on each of the features, and if you're in a waterfall, then you you actually spend the money on the features you said we're going to spend them on. It winds up you, you didn't finish right. You always some of your features are overdone and some are underdone. And what all agility is about. It's being able to rearrange whatever units of money you have, hours, people, money, rearrange them on all the same features so they actually all finish. That's all agility is. Okay? Um, I wish it was easy to do, but that's all it is. It reminds me of, uh, I'm a military guy. We used to have a race in the military where everybody starts off you know, with packs and guns and everything, a 10 mile run. And the time for your team is the time of the last guy that finishes. Team or team building exercise. And so when you finish, I'm a big guy, I used to be fit, uh, you know, 100 pounds ago. And the, uh, I'd always finish like three packs and a couple of rifles, and the guys that that stuff belonged to were carrying the other guys. And the idea is to get yourself across the line. That's what software development is all about when you think about a fixed price, fixed feature. Your job is to get all the features across the finish line. That's it. And that's where the agility is. So this is, this is the goal. Okay, hey, the down arrow works. Okay. So we're trying to, you can see, see the lower, the lower right hand feature here had a budget that was bigger than it needed. And so you have to steal from its budget for the other features and the budget wasn't big enough. And this is all, all large numbers, it's standard stuff. You know, when you estimate in the small, you're wrong. When you estimate in the large, you're right. So, you know, any given story point can be of almost infinite variation in how much effort it takes. Seems. But if you have a thousand of them, you can guess how long it's going to take to do a thousand of them. Very easily. He needs a mystery. That's the problem. And that's all this talk is about. All right. So we're going to talk about what the goals are. You know, when I when I talk uh, real fixed price development, I mean real fixed price development, not this. We'll be fixed price one sprint at a time. When we finally get somewhere, we'll stop. Which people are defining as fixed price. And I say that's not fixed price. That's commodity pricing. You buy one sprint at a time until you're happy. No, that's not fixed price. Fixed price is when you know when you're going to deliver and what you're going to deliver and how much it's going to cost. All three of the various systems. Otherwise, it's not fixed price. And since we're agile, we don't want quality to be very expensive. So what we're going to talk about is these four things. How do you actually set up a large team to be it? So you actually do it. How you estimate at the beginning so you have the right pot of money. Okay, what metrics do you use to find out how you're doing? Those are the real things you've got to worry about. And nowadays, by the way, it's very cool in the US, uh, how, do you have, how do you have a contract that's sort of lousy? These are the four variables, you know. And all you have to do is turn everything you think about in your PMP world, if you're a P2P, thinking in a waterfall way, stick everything you know and turn it upside down. Except for that, it's no problem. This is one of my favorite pictures. One of the things we have to realize in a is reality wins. Isn't that great? 
great picture. You know? <laughs> but the thing is, reality wins. Now, project managers are taught that plans win, expectations win. I really, really, really want it, you'll give it to me. No, it's not true. Reality wins. When reality and expectations collide, agility must happen. Okay. Must, not should, not may, must happen. So this is, this is the mind shift you have to have. It's got to go all the way to the top of your organization. That's one of the major mind shifts. Um, we also <coughs> believe in quality code. Now, why do we believe in quality code? Because we're nice to our code? No, we don't care about that. Not really. Chapter one of the first XP book that Ken Beck wrote is on flattening the cost of change. And he says the reason we do this is to flatten the cost of change. Why? So we can trust our philosophy. We can use velocities to project into the future. That's why we do it. Not about the cost. It's about predictability. We want to flatten the, flatten the cost of change curve. And so this is one of the promises. Now, is it totally flat? Probably not. I think that as the system gets large, I think the, the effort goes up a little bit. Um, you know, probably as a function of a log of the thing or something, or you're adding magnitude and things that I mean, it's not going to be as easy to find the places you need to change when a system is large. Even if changing as you get there is going to be just as easy. Finding the place is going to be hard. Now, once and only once. Well, that's once in a million things as opposed to once in a hundred things. So finding that is going to be kind of rough. So how do we manage this? Well, we use definitions of doctrine, right? Another thing we have to do, we actually have to do the stuff we're supposed to do to keep our cost of change curve down. Quality can't be the variable. Another major change. How many of you work in companies where quality is very, or certainly a variable? Yeah, exactly. And if quality is a variable, you're host. We all know that. And since I'm a scrum guy, I want self-organizing teams. I don't think it's required for agility. You can have very command and control agility. And if you think of rough done right, it's very command and control agility. Um, XP. I'm not convinced that when you have 14 well-defined processes that you do them where you're not really doing XP is self-organizing. Okay, just saying. <laughs> but I love, I love self-organizing. This is a, I've been to one of these. Awesome, awesome. 200 guys just show up. And you do, what you do is based on what tools you brought. You're afraid of heights? Nope, you're up there. Down here, what are you gonna do? Very cool, totally self-organizing. All right, so let's get started with it. This is what a framework is, or a process. It's people plus process produces product, right? That's the basic formula. Now, the way we're taught is that if you trust the process, the product ensues. In other words, process produces product. People are ancillary to it. Process produces product. Just have people get product. Agility is different. Agility is more lean. Agility says the product pulls itself from the people. Another major change you have to go through. The process pulls itself from the people. The product pulls itself from the people. And the process, if you're self-organizing, is malleable. The definition of done is not malleable. The process for achieving it is. It just completely changes the way you do it. Okay. So here's just a list of the things. You have to change your muscle memory. This is what uh, Ken Schwaber talked about in the first books, that in order to do Scrum, you have to change your muscle memory. In the, in the Enterprise and Scrum book, anybody actually read that? It's actually the best of the three Scrum books. Because it's about how the organization changes. And he says you have to put, a, uh, you put a scrum, uh, enough Scrum in place so that the people can develop stuff while they're changing the way they think. And once you have that much Scrum in place, then they can start changing the way they think. Simple message. Only took them 120 pages to say it, which is pretty cool. Because uh, basically all of his books have 30 pages of content and 90 pages of other stuff to make it thick enough to publish it. That's my own opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to prefer self-organizing teams over lone wolfism and tightly controlled management and so on and so on. I love the values. The values are very cool. Some people preach the values a lot, one of them. And it just keeps going and going and going. So let's talk about one of the problems. Here's a a basic 
contractual agreement. We have the developers over here, the stakeholders out there, project <coughs> management office in the middle, making sure we can't really talk to them, contract, you know. And we talk to them anyway, and we wind up with a change we have to make. Say, hey, we gotta make a change. What do we do with that? Well, we have to submit a change request, we have to get permission to change it, and then we have to change it, and then we realize it wasn't really right. And this is just slow. And this is what you have to do to be agile in a large organization, is smooth up the change management. It's very expensive, but you can do it. So, what do you do if you want to do it? And this is actually the key. Well, you take this figure eight and you smush it, twist it around, to see if this worked out. Put our subject matter expert basically on the scrum team, or right next to the scrum team, depending on your definition of the scrum team. Okay. What's interesting about this, by the way, is in a large organization, you know, that's a good discussion I have. Who's the product owner? Is it that subject matter expert or is it the team lead? How many thinks it's a subject matter expert? How many thinks it's a team lead? Okay. The answer is, in a fixed price contract, it's a team lead. You follow the money. Who actually has the final say <coughs> on the spent? That's the product owner. If it's a time and materials contract, that's a subject matter expert. If it's a fixed price contract, that's the team lead. Follow the money. Structure is the same. Very cool. So what happens? Well, you determine the need and you develop the solution. I have the empower to do this. Then you send in the change request and update the contract. This is what I did for 10 years, figuring out how to get the organization to build documentation as it went to represent what actually just happened. The very cool thing is when you deliver it, the documentation matches. So are you assuming the SME is a client representative? Uh, no, not the client, it depends. Do the best you can. Under the new rules that we'll see coming up in the very last few slides, it's actually got to be a member of the user community. <coughs> because not, not somebody between you and the user. One of the current bad processes in agility <coughs> is that you get an integration contractor that acts as your client. You build exactly what he, that integration contractor wants and it's the wrong thing with users. So that's uh, these are subject matter ex experts that aren't actually subject matter experts. So depends on your chain of command, who your subject matter expert is. Somebody who knows more than you do, at least, <laughs> increases the probability of success. But you said in a fixed price contract, you would say <coughs> the team lead as the, uh, the product owner. The team lead is still the product owner because if the contract <coughs> says, I want the $3,000 version of this, and you say, I only got $500, we're going to do the $500 version of this. That's what the product owner gets to make that decision. And in your government contracts, where the, the, the team leads were those government guys? Or no, they're, they're our guys. Because when it's a fixed price contract, it's, it's the contractor's money. I, I agree. So that, that's where the product owner is the, is the guy to get contract. Because he's the one that's got the final say in the money. It's an interesting discussion. It's, it's worth having in context. OK. Let's talk about where our buffer is. You're not possible, you're not, you can't be agile, you can't develop successfully a buffer somewhere. Now, in, a, in a, uh, a highly controlled environment, we don't have buffer, we have float, which means we, have, we think we know what we're doing, but actually we have buffer. So look at a situation like this. We might have a, a contract that tells us what product we're supposed to build. The product breaks into functional areas. I'm a use case guy, so you'll see this. Now, at these three levels, it's probably fixed. This is where it's actually fixed. And then your functional areas decompose into use cases, and your use cases decompose into stories that actually develop use cases. You have lots and lots of buffer here. How many stories does it actually take to build a releasable version of a use case? You've got at least 30% buffer for each use case. You've got all those nice to haves at the end of your at the end of your shit curve. You don't have to do those, they're nice to haves. One of the rules I'm talking about getting everybody across the finish line. Your goal is to develop every must-have before you develop any nice-to-have across the whole organization. <coughs> that's, that's why you get to set up an organization that, that, can, that can manage that. That's what we're talking about here. How many use cases do I actually need in this functional area? Or how many can I, can I solve with people and some instructions on how to do it? I'm developing a product that involves people in software and hardware. You know, how many of them can I processize? My people can do it. How many have to be done with the software? more buffer. Turns out, you get about 30% buffer here, about 20% buffer here, and it actually adds up to 50% of your effort is potential buffer if your estimate was correct. 
which means your estimate can be off by up to 30, 40 percent. You can still, if you're magically perfect on your agility, get there. This will be the this will be the big uh, thing in the future. Underbidding a lot because you think agility can squeak you over the finish line. Now we just get underbidding a lot so that we can have large change requests to make more money. That's uh, the way it is now. All right. Lots of agility. All right. Now let's talk about why this is hard. It makes <coughs> hard. Let's say we have a team that broke itself in half. <laughs> sorry, sorry, easy. A team that broke itself in half. But what happens here? We still have a product backlog at the product level. It's got to be decomposed into pieces for each team. Each team has to build their own piece of the product. They have to integrate it, and it has to be evaluated by the stakeholders. Huh. We also have to share subject matter experts. A lot of stuff going on. Okay, a lot of moving parts here. A lot of moving parts. Unfortunately, this is just the simple view of it. It gets worse. On each of the teams, let's see if this is going to work right. Um, anybody know what chores are? Stuff that don't provide business value, but you have to do them anyway. Right? Guess what? You don't want dad prioritizing for you. You, you prioritize them to solve the chore level. So the product owner at each level gets to prioritize his own chores and mix them into the stuff that's coming down. And there's a variability in how much, how many chores he has to do. And they have their own local sub, uh, subject matter experts that evaluate their system. Nobody can keep track of all this for just two teams. What if they have this? Yeah, it's an ugly mess. How many moving parts are that you got to manage on any given day? This is why we have like really highly planned out things so we can pretend there aren't moving parts. Or we don't want there to be moving parts because we can't manage them. But the fact is there are moving parts, and if you're in Agile, we're managing the moving parts to take advantage of our buffer. That's exactly what agility is, managing your moving parts. <coughs> making it hard on yourself to be able to manage your buffer. It's a mess. How do you do it? Actually, we have solutions. The solution is called, well, it was originally called the Scrum of Scrums, so it didn't really work. But the product owner team does. We have an example a project team that's made up of three development teams. We take the product owners, we take the product owners and put them on their own team. This team's job, this team's job, is to facilitate communication, cooperation, solving cross-cutting issues, and things like that at this level. Okay? Maybe every day, right after their team's meetings, all the product owners meet together and they say, this is what my team saw, this is what my team saw, blah, blah, blah. And this is the key. I'll tell you about the key in a second. The key is that you have these all over the place. So let me, let me show you a large organization again. All right, so what's happening? You know, maybe these guys are producing bad code. They got some code quality issues. <clears throat> maybe these guys stuff isn't integrating well. Maybe people hate this product. You know, maybe the uh, the test lab needs some uh, needs some new servers. Maybe, maybe, maybe all this stuff's going on every day. <coughs> Who's managing this? One thing I heard from a student: if you don't manage your constraints, your constraints will manage you. I love it. You know, the impediments will gobble you up. And by the time, <coughs> by the time the impediments have gone from being risks to becoming problems, you're host. So how do you manage this? Is the guy at the top do it all? No. In a highly controlly command and control environment, <coughs> yeah. All the problems go up. Dad solves them. All the answers come down. You know, it takes you two days to get an answer for anything. I needed the answer in five minutes, so I got it two days later. <coughs> That's, there's a chapter on that in uh, Coburn's book. Something about um, the $20,000 minute or something like that, where you needed something in one minute, cost $20,000, cost you $20,000, you didn't get it for two days. Thanks. So, what you do is you set up these product owner teams everywhere. All these red things. Is the product owner team. 
They are the glue that holds the organization together. Now, have you ever seen an organization like this? I have. U.S. Army. This is what they do. Okay? This is what they do. What's interesting is I was actually reading a, a, the Army's a leadership manual. They have manuals for everything. And the number one thing about leadership is training your people to make decisions. It's the Army's definition of leadership. Train your people to make decisions. And then you don't have to make them. Right? The idea here is the responsibility of each of these teams. This area manager here with his three dev team managers, if these guys have a problem, he solves the problem. To the best of his ability, it passes his solution up to the next level. They don't like it, they can change it. But the thing is, by training your people to make good decisions, you make the right decision 95% of the time, and you have as streamlined a system as you can possibly have for all the decisions. Problems are coming up, decisions are coming down, and everybody knows what's going on as much as they need to. This guy has no idea what's going on over there, but it's not his problem. The only guy who needs to know that stuff and that stuff is this guy. This team up here. They're the only ones that have to know that stuff. So make sure they're the only ones that do know that stuff. Don't pollute your mind with stuff that's not part of your rice bowl. It's one of the military terms over. Stay in your own rice bowl. You know? Solve your problem. Assume the people above you and sideways know what they're doing. You do your job. Uh, my son's in the Army and he said, he described himself, he says, I'm a cog in a big machine. And I said, yep, that's what you are. And he had hope that the machine is made up of cogs that all work together. And it has enough redundancy that the cogs that don't work can replace the system. <coughs> so, Okay, this is a communications network, and it's also a layering of agility. Now, and I'm not going to go into any details on this because this is a long discussion. But the two lessons are these. You want to make your decisions at the last responsible moment, to get back and lean, and at the lowest possible level. Those are two lean principles. Make the decisions at the last responsible moment, at the lowest responsible level. Push the decision making down. That's how we do the agility, okay? Agility is balancing the realities. Now notice that when you push the decision making down, you become very nimble, but you increase the probability that you're making mistakes from management's perspective. I let these kids make decisions, right? Well, yeah, that's why I hired them, right? Well, I heard them because they were cheap. Okay, how's that working out for you? There, there we go. <laughs> you know, so, so what I want you to do is, I always have people talk so I can drink and relax and watch people talk. So I'm gonna you take five minutes and talk about what we just did. The next slide I'll ask any questions. You can ask them on that point. But I want you guys to talk in groups, figure out what's confusing you, and ask me. I'll spend five minutes doing that. And I'll see if I can find my thing. <laughs> Question, Dan. I'm going to go to the next page. If you can ask, ask the question. Let me. Okay. Let me okay. just let me just irritate you. Oh, <laughs> Gee, that was hard. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite people to irritate. Okay. What's your question? <laughs> so you had that um, collaboration network thing. Yes. And the question I have is, my experience with product owners is that they're not full time on the project. And so expecting them to be the purveyors of risks and issues around the organization up and over and through yep. 
for me, I, I have not seen that work. Well, the, the people, I would say that the people you've seen as product owners aren't actually product owners. I would agree They're with you. They're subject matter experts that want to be product owners. Those organizations don't have product owners. Because okay. product owners are people that are full-time on the team, making decisions for that team. They're the lieutenant in a platoon, captain in a company. You know, they're not, the, the, the two-star general is not the platoon's product owner. So how do you apply that model to a remote delivery? <laughs> make sure, make sure you know, that the product owner is with the developers. All of that yeah. um, would, you, would you basically position remote product owners at the various locations? But yep. you would have several people basically acting as a product owner. Yeah, see, these are all the difficulties that come. You have to look at the perfect situation first, which is what Scrum does. It says, I mean, Scrum says, Basically, basic scrum says, assume you have six people in a room. Okay, that's hard enough. And then people want to make, you know, then, you, then what do you do when I don't have six people in a room? Well, you can't do it with six people in a room. Don't try the other stuff. <coughs> this, that's my solution. But the thing is, people want to try the other stuff because make the problems very hard for themselves. So you at least have to have the theory for how it's going to work with six people in a room or 50 people in a building. You know, and once you have the theory, then you can figure out what's, what you have to do to make it work for your reality. But right now, we don't have the theory. People that say, what do I do in my reality? Well, pretend that's not your reality. That's what the Scrum Master job is. Do the right thing. Yeah. So I had a, a clarification I wanted to start this question with. Yes. I think early on you described that you were talking about a contracting situation. Yes. And that this product owner was really part of the subcontractor. Well, the contractor. Company, or the contractor. Yes. And, and could you tell me more about why you chose that? And I, you use a term I like called follow the money. Follow the money. And, and I have seen a lot of situations where when you follow the money, the person with that money is so far up in the organization that they can't even possibly touch the teams. That's right. But because the point of is, sponsorship. Exactly. Um, and so you have to, the thing is, if, if only the person who's in the contracting organization can be entrusted to spend the contractor's money well. Certainly the subject matter expert can't be. It's not in his best interest to spend the money well. It's not his money. So you got to say, whose money is it? You know, and if in a fixed price world, the, the ball is in the developer's court at that point, the developers have the money, you know. Um, until there's a change request, in which case it bounces back and forth in negotiations, is it acceptable? But uh, yeah, that's a very, very interesting problem, uh, and I think it's 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 very very funny because when you go back and you look at the original Scrum, the idea was a client would be sitting outside the team, throwing requirements at the team, the team would throw back a product. That's very 1995 Scrum, <coughs> and it kind of changed a little bit, but not that much by 2001. And by 2007, it had changed significantly. Um, but, but the thing is, that way fit in well with the tenor of the times. Namely, I throw a requirements document back, I get back a product, but I do it in small bits. Major improvement over large, long bits. But um, we're talking the ultimate, the ultimate agility here, where you're agile, agile inside a sprint, you're agile, agile inside the team. You know, <clears throat> that's kind of where I want to be. Uh, but the, as, the answer to the question is, to follow the money, it's the contractor's money. So when you said that, and I was contemplating that interesting view that Johanna took, which was product owners all representing the red lines, the glue, if you will, yep. between all these different parts. Well, that's product owner teams are the glue. Yes, yeah, so product, product owner teams. Product owners are the nodes. I get that. I get yep. that very much. Um, so I, I value product owner teams. I, I still looked at that as um, being unique to the domain that you're describing, which is a contractor. Is well, no, because the, the, the head of that product owner team could certainly be a client. But the beauty of a team is the team members own their commitments. So the, the product owner of a team could say, this is what I want you to do. And they say, no, we're not going to do that. You know, we own our commitments. And the negotiation ensues. So if you had three contractors and then you had a client, then there's a contract. That negotiation takes place inside that team and not any place else. I seek understanding. I'm sorry. About Don't feel that. This is not, that's why. That's why we're going to move on to the, the easier stuff, which is the product owner stuff, which is how do I actually do them? But the thing is, if you don't do this very well, the stuff I'm going to talk about now won't matter. Okay. You know, if you're not actually agile, 
then knowing the process for managing will not help you. <laughs> so this is this is the big issue. Um, you know, and this is just my process. There's other ways. Sure. Clearly, you can have command and control agility. You know, but it's slower. When you're doing self-organizing teams, this carries the self-organizing team concept and scrum to extremes. And that's and that's what I like. Yes. Um. <clears throat> So a big part that's still missing for me is is when you're talking fixed price contracts yep. right, and, and being agile, to me, a big part of that uh, means recognizing uh, that what the client asked for at the start of the project is, is probably not what they actually need. That's what we're going to talk about next. Okay. Good. That's why I said at the top two layers of, the, of that uh, thing I showed where you have the product and you have the functional areas, that's probably real. The use cases and the stories are definitely not. That's where the agility has to happen. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to uh, talk a little bit about release planning because uh, if you talk about the whole project, it's going to be impossible. If we talk about portfolio management, it's going to be more, more impossible. But let's talk about release planning because that's what gets us to where we want to be. Now, when you're talking about Scrum, generally these are the things you might have read about. <laughs> You know, the product backlog, the sprint goal, and the sprint backlog. None of that is about releases. Uh, people have tried to jam the release planning exercise back into Scrum, and I think that's cool, but they don't know how to do it. So I'm going to try to talk about that. This is my view of a release plan. It has these pieces. You know, and that's, that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, the thing about release planning is it's very cool. It's a balance, right? It's a balance of features and uh, time and team. That's, I mean, so you gotta have all three of those things nailed down. But any, th any one of them can be the variable by the simple formula of time, time, capacity, equal scope, where we're measuring this in story points or function points or something. So how many sprints do I have? Uh, what's my velocity, my capacity? It tells me what my scope is. Any three of those could be the variable. Any one could be the variable, excuse me. Any one of those could be the variable. So if time is the variable, I know what, you, what I want, when am I gonna get it? If scope is the variable, I know when I want it, what can I have? And if, if the one that's fixed, if both of those are fixed, then the issue is velocity. How fast does my team have to be, which then tells me how big my team has to be, which leads me to my fixed price velocity. And so we're gonna talk about that one to start with. Make some simplifying assumptions. We're just gonna do one release. We're gonna have one team. Uh, we have a reasonable relationship, blah, blah, blah. These simplifying assumptions allow me to not get into the realities that don't matter for this, just the realities that really matter in real life but not, not about the theory. And um, what we're gonna talk about is a airline website. Uh, Sir Jeff is upsizing his boutique airline to a real airline and he wants a real website. And he says, uh, what do you want, Sir Jeff? I want all this stuff in six months. How much is it gonna cost? We've never had that question, right? Here's what I want in six months, how much? Okay. I think a little excursion here and talk about function points. Because, uh, or if you prefer story points and function points, how do we size these things? And the interesting thing is we've been sizing software now for 30 years. We know how to do it. We don't get it wrong. You know, our software does actually have the size we say it was gonna have. We just built the wrong stuff. We built this much of the wrong stuff instead of the right stuff. The agility didn't happen, but we built the right stack of stuff for the money we had, right size stack, just the wrong stack. It goes back to the first slide I had. I've seen that happen so many times. I got all these nice to haves and I left out two of the must haves. Bad contract. Okay. But you said you wanted, well, I changed my mind. Now, if you, anybody in here done function point calculations? See, if you had, you would hate them. <laughs> the IFPUG International Function Point Users Group calculation techniques are heinous. They are grotesque. But there's a different one called Cosmic. I know. Great name. Cosmic. Because of the name, I think it's not taken seriously, but it's actually pretty cool. It's been around for 20 years. And all it does is it measures, and this is for counting function points, arrows on a sequence diagram. You have your system here. How much data moves into the system or into the database? Into or out of the system or into or out of the database? Basically, count up the arrows, bang, there's your function point calculation. So you calculate a function point one scenario at a time, one thread at a time. That's how you actually calculate it. It's pretty simple. Let me show you some examples. 
back in our context. And I'm going to link it back into Scrum here. So here we have a, a small transaction, uh, you know, add traveler to itinerary. I put in some data, it gets persisted. Size is two function points. So I say, well, its story is two story points. So it's a small transaction. It's a small story to implement the small transaction. Story points equals function points. Well, that's cheating. Yeah, duh. But what's wrong with that? Yes? You're building. You're building the sequence diagram as part of the story, so you don't know it starts. No, no, no. I'm saying if I knew it. Oh, yes, This is my know. exemplar. Okay. This is my exemplar. I'm not going to do the estimating by counting story points. That would be crazy. Um, but I have to have exemplars. So these are my exemplars. Here's another one. I put in some data. I talk to a back end system. I get some data back. I put it out. Medium sized story. Four cosmic function points of, for the trans. Uh, the transaction is a four function point, the story is a four story point to get it implemented. And then if there's a large. Okay. So what do I actually do if I was estimating? Is I would take these three exemplars, and I have functional story, and I'm going to turn to the team, and I say, pull out your cards, guys, get your cards out. Which one of these is this most like in terms of moving parts? And they talk about it and say, medium large. Bang. 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 Just bang them out. So the functional ones, by the way, the cool thing is, if you say it's a medium, and all of a sudden you go in and you start working on it, and you realize it's like a super duper extra large, you ask yourself, what happened? It's a retrospective issue. Okay, why are we estimating this type of story badly? Or are we just having internal scope creep, and it really is that small, or we're just collating it? These are good questions. For non, uh, for architecturally significant stories, this is actually key. I, I, was, I was talking to a guy about this who's a, uh, government guy, and he said, let me guess, and for architecturally significant stories, you count up the functional points and double them, right? And I said, I love you. Yeah, because you get two things of value, function point, story points measure a value. You get two things of value. You get not only a function point, but you get an architectural decision. And then for non-functional ones, you just say, how much effort would it take? Which one of these has about have the same amount of effort? So the idea is that you wind up with story points that a on average, a function point takes one story point worth of work. One function point takes one story point worth of work. Now there's lots of things that you do that don't produce function points. It turns out that this is historically true since the 80s. Half of your work is functional, the other half of the work isn't. So you would expect that you'd have twice as many story points as function points. Okay. Now you have to actually see this to believe it. But, so back to where we were. So now we have these function points. This is what the guy wanted. Here's the cool thing. This is pretty unique, use case guy. So a use case is a collection of scenarios. Each scenario, single scenario, has a single black box test and a sequence diagram, conceptually at least. Therefore, the black box <coughs> test leads to a story. The sequence diagram tells me how big it is. Done. Piece of cake. Well, at least for the functional scenarios. It turns out that, is Gerard in here? Okay, good news. His uh, props for stereotypes. Not all use case driven development has functional stories. There are non functional stories as well. Anyway, so if we knew how many scenarios a use case was going to have, and this is where we estimate scenario the use case small, medium, large use case. My experience is that it takes between 10 and 40 scenarios to get it releasable version of a use case, so a small one is 10 scenarios, a medium one is 25, a large one is 40 use cases, approximately five function points per story, bang, there you go, there's my budget for use case. It's a small use case, 125 per story, something like that. Which it turns out, because the architecturally significant ones, is actually 150 story points. So, we go back to these things he said we wanted, we do this kind of an exercise, we estimate how many function points there are, you know, stickies on a wall, using the cards, uh, innovation games, whatever way you like to estimate that kind of stuff, talking to your stakeholders, and come up with, here's the sizes for all these things and here's function points. These are risky, so we put big numbers on them, because we're not stupid. Comes out to 965 function points. That's our budget. And how much does that cost? Function, function point. And how much does that cost? Well, there's a universal constant, 20 hours per function point. It's been true since 1980. 
And if you don't like that, you Kokomo it, and you get a number between 14 and 35. Right? If you know what I'm talking. If you know what I'm talking about, you're nodding your head. That's, I see at least two people nodding. Yeah, I know that stuff. Okay. There's your budget. Just turned into hours. I went from function points to hours. One fell swoop. There's plenty of slop. If I'm off by a little bit, it's not very much. We got tons of data. I've got Capers Jones um, spreadsheet. He says you can't trust this spreadsheet. There's only 13,000 projects worth of data in it. Not enough data yet. Can't quite trust it. I'm going, well, we just make stuff up now. <laughs> you can also do this with story points. I put it in here just for fun. Um, the team traditionally, my, my estimation, the team does about 50 story points in a sprint, and you can work your way up. Anyway, this would be, in 20 hours, this is going to be 19 people for six months. I work through a story point exercise. It comes out to, I need to produce 80 function points per sprint, and which is going to be approximately three development teams, and so I need, you know, between 18 and 24 people, depending on how many people are on my development teams. So the number comes out the same, it's about 20 people. I need 20 people for this for six months. Yes? I don't know if you're going to address this still, but <clears throat> when, I, when I hear all this stuff about uh, function points and estimating, the thing that comes to my mind is uh, it seems like you would be spending, <clears throat> investing a lot of effort uh, doing analysis and estimation. No, that took two hours. Uh, I said, how big is this use case? It's a small, 50 function points, let's go. Wait, but when we talk about sequence diagram, like drawing no, you sequence don't do diagrams out for you everything. Don't. Okay, you gotta go back to the, to the slide that says, you do not do the sequence diagrams oh, okay. to count your function. You <laughs> estimate them at the use case level. But even uh, even when, I, when I'm doing, trying to do fixed price contracts, uh, figure it, getting uh, a level of confidence enough that I can put a cost on that, that I'm going to charge them, it takes it takes a significant amount of analysis for large, for significant size projects. Well, and let me tell you, that doesn't work. Because we wind up taking a big problem, dividing it up to small problems, making estimates and adding them back up. And if you know anything about you always off by 30%. By the way, it's not because you did it wrong, it's because that's statistics. Um, we, we usually do a, a bottom-up estimate and a top-down estimate, usually different people, and, and put them together afterwards and see how close they are. And I, I mean, I'm just saying, I've been doing this for, for decades, and it takes about two days, and you get enough of an estimate that's good enough to go with. Now, in order to get people to believe it, yes, you've got to do a lot of stuff. Okay, get, believe the estimate. But the estimate is correct. It's like, how much is a 3,000 square foot house going to cost? Well, it's $150 a square foot. Bang, $150,000. Okay, let's go build it. I want more. You don't need more. Just want more. See, this is this is another one of those issues. You got to change the way you think about it. Get a big pot of money, spend it wisely. Well, I mean, don't get the right size pot of money because it's not. Even on my well, one of my most recent projects, which was uh, a fixed bid project, and uh, in that case, our, our issue with giving the cost up front is the client didn't even really have a good picture of what they wanted or needed. And when, and when they had this vague requirement in the RFP, and we asked them, what does this mean? What does this well, mean? What do we need to do yeah, let's talk that. about that. When we yeah. talk about the contracting, that's a different issue. Okay. We're talking about a sizing exercise where we know what the use cases are. If we don't know what the use cases are, we're going to do something else. I mean, this is only going to work. It's the ideal situation, remember? It's only an hour and a half. We don't have three weeks. <laughs> so we get back to Sir Jeff and say, I need 20 people. I don't got them. What do you want to do? He says, well, what do you got? I got eight people. You got a path up right now. He says, well, tell me what they can give me in three months. Okay. We just changed the type of release plan because that's what I get to do. Um, so now we take a different kind of release plan where I have a team. I got a date. What can I squeeze in there? And so it's the same sort of exercise. The math is a different variable. Here's what the team did last time. How many uh, story points? Back, uh, which is story points? Back to story points. I say this team can last, based on the last six sprints. It's a, it's an e-commerce website. Can't be that much different than an airline website, considering the backend system already exists. Um, you know, I'll give them a velocity of about sixty. I'm happy with that. In the last six sprints. And you come up with this thing where you size how many story points you think they can give you. Now we're not building a backlog yet. See, I don't want to build a backlog. I want to build a backlog the last. Responsible incident. It's not the first thing to do. So, this is how many story points I think I can get. There's a guy on vacation, spends five and six, and it turns out to be 335 story points. You know, 
30-30 in a transition spread. You don't get the full thing in a transition spread. 60-60, 60-60 minus something for a guy's, guy's missing. Talk to the team about this. The team says, eh, 335 story points for 2,800 hours. Looks good to us. You know? Is it real? No. Is it a good estimate? Yeah. Are you, am I willing to, to, to put a number on this and actually offer somebody something based on this? Oh, yeah. I got three months to make it happen. What we do now is we start figuring out how many story points are actually going to be functional instead of just saying half, which you could do. I'm actually throwing things out, like uh, taking away a release spread because the last spread's going to get no additional functionality. Um, maintenance for the system they're already working on, chores, subtract all things, all these things out, <coughs> and using some, you know. Rules of thumb, come up with 178 story points. You can round it, number one exact. 178 story points will be functional. Now, if you believe in that whole uh, architecturally significant stuff, that's somewhere around 150 function points worth of it. So, this is where we do the we go back to estimating the, the, uh, the use of the actual use cases. Now we got 178 story points to play with. We go look and say, what can you get for that? Here's, here's what I like to use. Numbers like these for small, medium, large use cases in terms of, in terms of uh, story points, something like that. Like I said, 10, <coughs> 25, 40. Now, one thing if you're doing a website, use cases are a lot less complicated than if you're doing a client server app. Because websites always have the 1-800 call us for the rest number, which you don't have your client server app. They all got to be there, you know. So they're a lot more complicated than bigger. So people that try to move from doing websites to client server are always taking in the shorts, and that's why. Because they're, the websites, the use case is like three times as big, and they don't take it. In. But that, that's why the, the it's an interesting money, uh, interesting uh, cost benefit analysis there. Changing from a client, doing the next one instead of a client server app into a website with help desk. Very interesting mathematics to try to work. Cost you one third as much for the development, then you got sustaining help desk people. Very interesting. Anyway, back to the PMP again. Our basic S shaped curve for delivery. This has been around forever. It's not mine, it's not Agile's, it's, it's just the software's. And what happens is if you're delivering a use case, basically, you deliver the architecturally significant scenarios first, and you build your walking skeleton, or in my case, a backbone. Then you build your must-haves, and then you build your nice-haves. That's what you want. That's the purpose of a product owner, is to, is to prioritize these in this order. That's why you don't do it with a plan, because plan, some must-have turned into nice-to-have, a nice-to-have turned into a must-have, you build them in the wrong order, and what happens at the end. So you've got to be constantly reprioritizing. And because you're constantly reprioritizing, you have to build code that can change easily, and you go all the way back to that the stuff we're not good at. You know, which is writing code that doesn't change, that changes easily. So, about approximately one third of your effort for the architectural significant stuff, one third of your effort for the must haves, one third of your effort for the nice to haves, which is also your buffer then. They're nice to haves. So that's your buffer, it's your rework, it's your nice to haves, the last third. That's where that 30% of effort comes in at the, at the end. That's your buffer. And this is if you know what the use cases are. If you don't know what the use cases are, you can use more buffer. Don't, don't you find that in a contracting org, at least in my experience, that the night you never do the nice haves. If you finish the must haves under budget, you pocket the rest as margin because if you go over budget, the client's not going to pay you extra. Well, then don't go over budget. That's an easy one. <coughs> but ask the client what he wants to spend the money on unless you have a contract that allows you to pocket it. I don't know. Well, Government contracting, you're not allowed to. Well, if it's fixed price, you can, right? Cause no, the government contract, you're not allowed to. You make 8% done. It's fixed price, but we monitor your hours anyway. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Yeah, so, for all your actions, like, say, the requirement, uh, are they all, because it's under, like, you can make pretty good estimate on how much of the at the at the epic level, yes. Right. But uh, are they usually for requirement that that's something that they can ask? Well, that would be a good idea. Yeah, but okay. if no, no, you know the 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 thing. There's actually two estimates. We'll talk about it at the end. There's the estimate of how many, how big is this thing in terms of story points, and then there's another estimate of how fast does it take me to develop the story point. These are independent. 
And, and uh, the second one, report, you, you want a team that had experience, so you, you just have to take a guess. You know, but if the team has experience, you can make a better guess. This is why uh, we're, every, all the contractors are hurt. They haven't done this. They don't have the, the, uh, the baseline to do uh, the fixed price contracting and actually get numbers they can trust. They don't know how to do it, but they don't have the data for it. And, 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 the, and the government is now saying, well, yeah, and I'll show you the contract. The contracting it actually says you should probably start off with time and materials in order to gather the data. That's actually part of the federal acquisition regulation in the US. Anyway, trying to get done with this. So, bottom line, the team negotiates with Sir Jeff and comes up with this. Let me tell you what this is. We think that buy an e-ticket is going to take 150 story points, but if we're lucky, we can do it for 100, right? So, we have a, 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 a we say, we guarantee you, you will get buy an e-ticket, but if you, Sir Jeff, work with us so we can get the buy an e-ticket faster than that, you can have this other stuff too. That's the right way to do a contract. It's a win-win, lose-lose. Win-win is easy. The problem is if you're on the win-win, if you're not also on the win-lose on the winning side, see, you don't want to win-lose. You want to win-win, lose-lose. Tightly coupled. So they say, this is what you could get if everything went right and you help us get this for 42 less than we think we really need, really need. So um, well, we have a chance for the s shape curve. By the way, why do you, how many of you know the 80-20 rule? Right, in retrospect, the 80-20 rule is actually real. In retrospect, if you did the right 20%, you would get 80% of the value. We don't live in retrospect land. We live in forwards building, you know? We go, we go this way, not this way. How much effort will it take to, to generate 80% of the effort? How much? How much effort does it take to generate 80% of the value? 80% that would be totally random, 100% hope not. You basically think 50%. Product owners are smart enough to give us 80% of the value for 50% of the effort. And uh, this is about four years ago I noticed I drew the 80-50 curve, you know, calculating it. And I looked at the S-shaped curve and I said, you know, magically, the last two thirds of the S-shaped curve are exactly the same shape as the 80-50 curve. Which means that after you have the architecturally significant stuff, and I'll have these pictures later, that going the must-haves, nice-to-haves, which you do every time, is just 80-50. There's no magic there. You just got to make a guess. Which one of these is most important and get it right two-thirds of the time? It's not even hard. But you got to do it. But it's not hard. Anyway. I'll just mention this. So there's 178, and there's the rest. We know the 108 is risky. Okay. Now, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> we had kind of had that discussion. Let me just show you what the release plan looks like. Let me come back and talk to you. That. that was a discussion where you guys talked for five minutes about that negotiation and how hard it would be. But I have a feeling that we wouldn't have finished. We only got half an hour. So, sorry about that. We talked about that. So what do you actually do? Well. Our goal is, we promise, we will get you the initial release of the website, and you must be able to sell a ticket. Do I know what sell a ticket means? Not exactly. But I know enough. I mean, I, I, I always ask this question. I know exactly what sell a ticket means. Well, do fat guys get to tell you on the website that they need an extender belt as part of your sell a ticket? Is that in or out of scope? Oh. Is having the fact that I need, I'm actually going to take a live pet on board, enter out of scope on the website, or do I have to call them up? How about uh, vegetarian meals? Is that enter out of scope for on the website? Oh, well, I don't really know exactly. That's your buffer. Those are all your nice to have. I don't know which ones of those you're going to get. Are you allowed to buy a ticket with PayPal? Hmm, that would be cool. Yeah, but is it, is it, is it in scope? Is it required? Hmm, I don't know. Okay, this is, this is what we have to work with. It's all that stuff. Okay. And we'll see that in this particular case for Catalina Air, it's kind of interesting. So here's our strategy. First, we'll learn how to use Cutlass as the back end system. Then we're gonna get a minimal buy ID ticket as fast as possible. And if Sir Jeff, help, Sir Jeff helps us with this, then we can do status of flights and investigate pilot time sheets. That's our strategy. And he buys into it. And if our strategy was followed, we would get this. Isn't that pretty? That's our, I, 
hate to say it, that's our moral equivalent of the Gantt chart. I say that, you should have gone, ooh. But it is. But it's not about effort. It's about story points. How many story points, how, much, how many story points are we going to get on these things, if we're lucky? Do we know it's real? No, that's why it's called a game plan. I, got, I, I say, every coach has a game plan that shows he wins. Half of them are wrong. You no, know, it's that simple. So your game plan is bound to be wrong. That doesn't mean you can't adapt, and you will. That's where the agility comes in, you have to adapt to the game plan. Okay, so any questions on this thing? Do you believe you can actually do this? I actually do, uh, um, actually I'm doing it again. It's a tutorial on release planning. It's always a fun one. 20 people in the room and basically I show them this one and then I say, now you're gonna do the next release. Here's what Sir Jeff wants for your team. Here's what Sir Jeff wants for your team. Here's what Sir Jeff wants for your team. And I tell you what, it's the word problem from hell. You know, that's it. That's, that I'll tell you. It's not impossible, but it is the word problem from hell. And you need to know your word around Excel. You need to have somebody who can do it. It's not trivial, but conceptually easy. It's straightforward. <laughs> straightforward yet difficult. But there's the result. So here we have our chores. This is the stuff we do that doesn't provide business value. There's the maintenance of our system, there's investigated cut list, there's a buy an e-ticket, blah, blah, blah. And there's our release activities over here. All right, so there we have our plan. Now what, now what do we do? We got a, we got a budget, you know, how many, we had how many hours, and uh, how many, we had a number of hours, 2,820 hours, so there's our budget. We have any story points, we know how we're gonna get. My metaphor here, is we're shopping for Christmas dinner. 20 people are coming over. You're gonna spend $20 a person, that's your budget, go. And you're not gonna to get to go to a big store where if you pick up the wrong stuff, you can put it back. <laughs> you know, what's your strategy? You're in, you're in Europe, if you're walking down the street, you're buying stuff, the bread store, the meat store, the cheese store, you know? What's your strategy? That's this. Buy the most basic things first. Ah, buy the most basic things first. Now that's always a fun one. Let's talk to our stakeholders about what's the most basic things. Somebody's going to say, don't you dare come home without a pumpkin pie. Somebody's going to say, you can lose the green beans if you want. Somebody else, I'm allergic to pumpkin pie. I really need the, really need the greens. That's what I can handle. Um, what, if, what if there's no uh, turkeys? Well, then don't even bother to come home. You know. You get all this guidance from your stakeholders. There is no such thing as basic stuff. There is stuff. And there is the product owner who decides which stuff you're going to deliver. You hope he gets it right. That's his job. And you hope he continues to talk with the stakeholders and gets good feedback from them to refine it and they come to closure. And this is a picture I drew at least 15 years ago that shows this is what the developers think they're building. This is what the stakeholders think they're getting. Time goes on. You hope they converge. That's agility. And at the beginning, you sure you're synced up. I know exactly what you want. I'm going to go build it. And you're probably 70% wrong. You know? And of course, time also travels. Anyway, so we have this plan. <coughs> so any questions on the plan? Because now we're going to look at the metrics. Then we can have full time for questions. So, how do you monitor this? We have to be able to know where we are so that we can have the input to agility. You know, agility is based on meaningful feedback. Well, lousy feedback leads to lousy agility. So we need meaningful feedback. This is what I learned. I was actually an intel officer. We were the meaningful feedback on the battlefield. If there was anything about agility in the military, it was Intel guys. This is what really just happened. Here's a picture. <laughs> Where'd you get that picture? Can't tell you. But there's a picture. You know, that was my job. So let's look at the uh, monitoring the release. So look what actually happened. And I'm pretty sure that that back arrow is not going to work. But 
Um, oops, not there. There we go. This is what we thought was going to happen. This is what actually happened. This is the number of story points that were produced. This is the number of hours that were expended. Notice that the total of 322 is well within any, it should have been 335 and 322, plus enough, not a problem. But look at some of this. See, uh, let's see. See these right here. Not too many hours, lots of story points. Those story points are easy, okay? Lots of hours, not very many story points. Those story points were hard. This is where when you start dividing things up, the law of large numbers kills you. The variability goes up with the smaller the set. Anybody who knows the law of large numbers, the intake, if something has an average of mu, right, little mu, you do 20, 500 of them. You take and divide the standard deviation by square root of 500. So you actually get some nice convergence as you go on. So what it saves you in release planning is that if you have variability on a typical story, if you use your basic, uh, it's called a beta distribution, a shape like this, and you, your variability is approximately 35%, the standard deviation is approximately 35%, which the variability is 70%, it's twice the standard deviation. But if you do 50 of those, the standard deviation is 5%, because you divide by the square root of 50, which is 7, it goes from 35 down to 5. And so the overall variation is 10%. And that's, you can live with 10%, which is why release planning works, but sprint planning based on velocity won't work. There's not enough stories in a sprint. So that's why I don't recommend doing velocity-based sprint planning. We do uh, what's called acceptance or commitment-based sprint planning. Sprint planning itself is agile. Anybody seen that stuff? We actually go down the stories and say, can we do that one? Can we do that one? Can we do that one? And you ignore how many points it is. And you look at the actual work. Me. Can we actually do them? Maybe your average is 10, you only signed up for 7. If your average is 10, we signed up for 17. Depends on whether they were easy ones or hard ones. But across the whole release, it averages out. In a sprint, it doesn't average out. And for any given story, who knows? So that's the math behind it. If we do it in the large, we're cool. Now let's look at some of the metrics. That's a beautiful thing. You don't even know what it is, but it's a beautiful thing. So this top line is the 335 story points we thought we needed. Well, something happened in the third third sprint. We went to Sir Jeff and said, you know that 108 story points we thought we could get that for? Just full, it's gotta be 150. We were right the first time. Now imagine that. You just walked in and said, we need 42 more story points. You didn't ask for more money. You said, we, need, we, gotta, we gotta find 42 more story points. You'd be freaking out, right? No. Now you're in slightly more aggressive buffer management mode. You've got the story points to play with. You just got to make sure you don't spin them on anything else. We'll show you that at the end. Right here, this line, this is how many story points produced. This line is how many story points produced minus the maintenance project because Sir Jeff did not care about those. This one's an interesting one. How many of you know about lean and having minimized your inventory? Minimize your inventory and lean. What is your inventory? A spec'd out requirement. That's your inventory. So like when you extract a story from an epic and put it on the back, backlog, it just became inventory. If it's sitting over here, it's just unallocated story points, it's not inventory yet. So this is how many stories have been extracted from the epics. <coughs> Did a little bit of initial analysis. And then you, you do more analysis. He, right there, this jump happens in an analysis meeting at the same time he told you you couldn't have it. And this here is your inventory. You want to minimize that, right? Two or three spreads worth. It's a little more than that here. Two or three spreads worth of inventory. The last thing you want is a requirement saying, hey, look at me, I'm done. Look, I got a table, I got data. Just, just do me. And it's wrong. How many of you know those requirements? You know? It's just wrong. It's not useful. But it's sitting there saying, hey, I'm good. Thank you. Just don't make them. Just in time. 
That's a whole different issue, the agile analysis thing. And down here we have our actual function points produced. Now, if anybody knows function points, function points are the measure. So when you actually finish something, you can draw the secret cipher for that scenario and count them up. Now, when you're bug fixing, you don't add any function points, but you do function point equivalents of work. I might do two function points equivalents, but I get no delta function points because I threw away two that were wrong and I added two that were good. That's what a bug fix is. So when things start to look like this, and they start to separate from how much work you're doing, how many function points you're getting, means you're fixing stuff, you wind up with your S shape curve, your function point S shape curve. And that's how you know you're about ready to deliver. You're just fixing stuff. You're not adding any new stuff. It has shape curves on the function points. This is the S shape curve that we know about. Anyway, fairly easy to produce this, actually. Okay, fairly easy to produce this. And it's got a lot of good information on it. That tells you about velocities, function point velocities. Notice that the number of function points is approximately half the number of story points. And even more. That's pretty cool. That's actually what you'd expect. Um, how many of you do earn value metrics? Ah, Grant, raise your hand. Earn oh. value metrics, I'm on your slide now. There you oh. go. Hey. SPI and CPI. Um, Earn value management is something it's, it's, it's going to be uh, required when we do fixed point stuff for the military and the government. Um, and so we have to make sure they actually measure the right things, which is earned story points or, or, or function points. I got a both here. And uh, cost performance index, CPI. Am I getting the story points for the amount I thought I should spend for them? Schedule performance index, SPI. Am I getting the story points as fast as I thought I was going to? So I go back to my initial data, and uh, I, can, I can plot what actually happened. So here's my story points, SPIs. Here's the baselines. This is the copy of those same rows we had way back when. And here's what actually happened. And by, cumul by cumulatively, you can calculate the SPI and the CPI. Now, the reason they're essentially parallel is because the team size didn't change. You see an awful lot of projects for SPI and CPI go like this, and what that means is I'm behind, I'm throwing people at the project, and so my SPI climbs back up to one of my CPI goes in the toilet because I'm throwing more people at the project. Oh, very common. Okay, this one, we, don't, we, didn't, we didn't screw up the estimates, we didn't have a problem, fairly parallel, no sweat. You can also calculate SPI and CPI based on the function points. Here's the calculations based on the function points. Um, now, since you're actually monitoring the functionality more closely than you are the story points, the story points are more fungible because there's chores in there and you own them, but the function points your client owns, right? So you, you really want to nail the function points, and you might squish the story points around a little bit, push some stuff up to the next sprint, like that new test box that's going to cost you six story points to install. Push it up until the next release. And so these nailed it. You know, he's nailed one. It's exactly what they said they were, they were supposed to get. And that's and that's your classic earned value metrics. And um, but in an agile sense, the thing that's really strange about earned value metrics is earned value makes more sense in agile projects than it did in regular projects. You know, well the requirements documents were twenty percent. Why? Because it's twenty percent of the cost. I mean, it's worth 20%. I mean, you got nothing until you actually, what? It should go like this. I got nothing and then I integrate it and I get everything. Well, that's not very useful. So then you had, am I spending money at the rate I thought I was going to expend it, which is really has nothing to do with our value. But most earned value metrics are that. Am I spending it at the rate I thought? It has nothing to do with how I was getting it. At least when we measure story points, we have something we got. We have a done story. Anyway. Uh, earned value is very powerful. And the reason it's powerful, more powerful than just velocity, is because with the cost performance and the schedule performance, it's hard to wiggle and, and, and lie with the data. You can always throw more people at a project and get the velocity up. You know, if you do it early enough. And I know. But you can do that. But then the cost performance come in. So you can't, it's hard, to, it's hard to cheat. The only cheating is with the uh, definition of done. And then you're looking good for a while, and then your bad code catches up with you, and both of them go boom. 
say, oh, fat, dumb, and happy, fat, dumb, and happy, running, running, running. My metaphor there is, uh, is a football field, and you turn it into a golf course, one sand trap at a time. And eventually, there's nothing but sand, really. <laughs> you know, and that, that's what happens to, actually, I've been on football fields that were like that, but that's a different issue. You know, you're about three seconds slower than 100 on these things. It's all mud and sand. I like that because I'll never have that. So how about our business value? Last metric. Um, business value is not something you can actually measure while you're doing the work. You can only measure it once you deliver the thing and you start selling it, and then you can say, do we actually make what we thought we were going to make on it? It's a little late to be managing your project that way now. You could use that for portfolio management by deciding whether or not you're going to have another project in this product. Is this product making us money? So I, I put you know, effort to make new new product. This other product isn't making us money, so I would deprecate it. But within a project, you have no idea if what you're building actually has value. All you have is, does it feel like it? But we put some numbers on it anyway, because we want to talk to Sir Jeff, by the way, uh, you know that passing tests is everything. So if tests stop passing, you lose the value. If tests keep working, you get its value, whatever that is. So here's what you do. This is what I do. Earned business value doesn't actually measure value, but it's an indicator, not a metric. It says, you know, if we had the estimate right, let's say it's 150 story points with our estimate, and we spent 50, we should be right here on the S-shaped curve. You feel like we're 40% of the way there, guys? You take that into the stakeholder meeting. You feel like you're 40% of the way done? No, we haven't even finished the architecturally significant stuff yet. We're clearly not in that spot on the curve. Well, then we need more budget on That's what actually happened in sprint three. So this is what happens. So you figure out, that's what I just said. That's the 80, 20, 80, 50 thing. So let's say that's 100% of my story points. I spent 40% of them. I expect to be right there which is 50% of my value. If I have an architecturally significant use case I'm building, if it's not architecturally significant, you just use the 80-50 curve. So I would expect to be right there, 70%. By the way, you see that 80-50 curve? I go back and look at the S-shape curve. The last two thirds of it are the same shape. One of the, that was magical. So I saw that, so that's magic. These guys, these guys got it right when they got the curve. They just gotta be agile to achieve it. It's the right curve, but you gotta be agile to achieve it. Anyway, and here's the data. Right here is where third sprint went in and said, you know, if it really was only 108, we'd be at 30% done, and we're not. <laughs> We haven't even finished half of the architecturally significant stories yet, so there's no way we're 30% done, because that's the first 30%. So we need more budget. So by putting more budget in it, you drop the earned value, apparent earned business value. Notice the aggressive buffer management. You get these guys minimally releasable, and you take all these story points you had at the end, and you put them on this. Okay? This is where you're robbing from Peter to pay Paul based on you want minimally releasable features, right? That's what we want before we get, before we start beefing them up. And then over here, this is just adding them up. We had these numbers, 80% of that one plus 10% of this one plus 10% of that one. So the whole project released at 97% of the value. Pretty cool graphs. Again, easy to calculate. Well, once you have the equations. <laughs> and this is uh, one of the things I had to fix up this, this, this uh, afternoon, because the font was wrong. So what we were talking about, let me just show you stories to epics. Here's an example of stories to epics. This is the epic, buy a, the buy a D ticket, and these are all the stories, and these are their uh, stereotypes, which we're not going to talk about. Um, the added sprint is when we actually stuck it, when we actually extracted it, the story from the epic, and stuck it in the backlog. So zeros mean it was upfront analysis, the initial meaning. 
and so on. And then what sprint did he get done in? Notice we didn't do all these down here, even though we found them, like uh, special needs is not going to be there, bring a pet on board is not there, pay with coupon is there, but um, telling me how many scuba tanks you need was there. That's what Sheriff cares about. He takes people to Catalina. How many, how many, how many scuba tanks you got? It's more important to him than are you bringing a dog. Okay. That's what's in there then. So, for example, by, there, these are your, your backbone uh, stories. Your, when, you, when you do a uh, use case, you have the backbone, architecturally significant main path. Then you have alternative paths. Then you have beefing up use cases on existing, beefing up business rules on existing paths. And then you have clean up the interface. This is not me, this is Gerard. It's all him, Gerard Massaros. I wrote this paper in 2004 on story time. Brilliant stuff. Brilliant stuff. So that's how you actually decompose your use cases. All right. That's the metrics. Got nine minutes. Put it in overdrive and do the. Right, any questions on the metrics? Can you so, go back one slide and tell us the columns? Oh, yeah. There was the sprint that you found. Okay. It. The sprint that you extracted it from the epic. Okay. The sprint that you did the work in. How many story points was worth small, medium, large? How many function point equivalents were produced? And how many. What was the delta of the function points? Okay. So this data here is what was used for, and then there's also an hours column. That isn't used in any of the metrics, so I deleted it. Okay. <laughs> so that was about 150 story points altogether? This is, well, it's 100, the, the, the total was 150 and it used 132. <coughs> you actually use the hours in that comparison graph between the function points or the story points delivered and the hours it took, and you use the comparison sum story. Yeah, but that was cumulative per sprint, not by story. But yes, so the story is cumulative by sprint to calculate the earned business, earned, earned value metrics, but not cumulative by story. I'm thinking that. Were those estimated hours or those were from a time tracking? These are time system? tracking hours. Okay. Uh, I, I would imagine that um, this would be useful if you're a really hardcore company and you wanted to see if an hour on one type of stereotype was different than an hour on other types of stereotypes, if they were, you know, that you could actually do some fine tuning there. But I don't think any of us in this room are within 10 years of needing to do that. <laughs> okay. So let me talk about contracting for a second. This is, this is quick. Because this is something I talk about with, uh, I've been around government contracting, military contracting for a long time, since the early 80s when I was a contracting officer on the government side, then I became a contracting officer on the civilian side. And the federal acquisition regulation basically says, share the risk. This is actually, negotiate a contract type of risk is reasonable contract for risk, which means share the risk. And so this is what leads into things. You also have, uh, this, is, this is old, a preference for agility delivering in discrete increments that are not dependent on any subsequent increment. The problem is there's a nasty word here called maximum extent practicable. And everybody said, that's not practicable for us, we're not going to do it, we're going to stay with our waterfall. But this has been around for 10 years, saying we prefer agility. Mill Standard 498, which was published in 1994, said we prefer agility. They use it agility, called iterative incremental. We prefer iterative incremental development. The government has been trying to get it out of contractors for 15, 20 years now. But they always put that maximum extent practical in there, and the contractor says, nope, not practical for us. Because actually the way we do things right now is what makes lots of money for contractors, the big contractors. And the government's tired of getting raped. I'll tell you that right now. And so they have said, you don't understand. So the next one. It also says that you should change your type to gather data. This is the latest one, Section 804, 2010, National Defense Authorization Act. There's no more practical one here. Shall develop and implement early and continual involvement of users. Notice it says users, not subject matter experts. Users. And multiple rapidly executed increments. There's no more wiggle room, at least as written. They'll find some. It's my mission for the next six months to make sure they don't find the wiggle room. <laughs> Um, 
but they've actually said, we will have you do Agility now. That's it. That's, the, that's, that's it. And they had 270 days to respond on how. So they got about 12 months left to respond on how they're going to do it. Here's my dream. What I'm hoping will happen is we will have scrummish teams that develop well understood, with well understood definition of done, there's probably a different, same, different in different domains, and they will sell function points as a commodity. What do you want? We'll sell you 50 function points a month for this much money. Here we go. We're ready. It's like miles of road. I don't know what road it is. Where do you want it? Give me six miles of road. Just tell me where you want it. Okay. They will have integration contractors that know how to work with the stakeholders and figure out what road you want. They're taking the epics and decomposing them into stories for you. That's their job. We already have this, by the way. <coughs> but the problem is, what we don't have is this last one, which is clients that show up with stakeholders and SMEs. You notice that that was subparagraph A. Thou shall show up with users. So right now, what, what's wrong is these guys belong to the integration contract. So they build the wrong thing. They show it to the stakeholders. And then they blame these guys. That's my worst. And it kind of sucks to be a developer. Because you feel like a bad person. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing, and I'm doing it well, and I'm, and I'm the one that gets, what's, what's, up, what's up with this? This isn't fair. You know, if you've done any government contract, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It just doesn't feel fair. You're at the bottom of this level. Anyway, that's the dream. And I think that we may have at least legally checked off the last checkbox to make the dream come true. But we won't be able to do it until we can manage these cones of uncertainty. How much effort does it take to produce a high fidelity function point? It's going to take many sprints of work by each team to figure that out, how much they charge. How many function points does it take to deliver a feature? It's going to take many releases in a domain to figure that out. So once we start doing it, there's going to be a lot of um, cost plus contracting to gather data. That's the big issue. And of course, the government's not going to want to do that because it will be out of control. So either that or have a really, really, really big buffer. So just keep in mind, this is where we're at. And the faster people start doing it, the faster they can get this information. And the more and the faster you can start winning these bids because you don't have to bid it, you know, you can bid the fixed price with a reasonable certainty. Now the government has to start believing that fixed price actually means fixed price and start and not give people money for underbidding. There's no bad behavior. It's government bad behavior. There's a lot of bad stuff going on right now in the fixed price world. But the solutions are there. We have them all. We just have to go do them. So Dan? Yes. I have a question on that. Then. So probably the biggest risk actually isn't whether or not we can do fixed price. It usually is the underbidding. So that is. Uh, that's another issue out of scope for here. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a good question. Because under under well underbidding is is the business model for many companies that I've worked. That's their business model. And unless the government decides to feed over the head of the stick, you won't. Have it. I see that as a bigger risk than. Yeah, but, but, if, but if you can't actually do fixed price and deliver for the amount you said, then nobody's going to believe that then you, you have nothing besides underbidding. I mean, underbidding is what you've got. So until somebody can actually do it successfully, you've got no leverage. So you've got to, you got to, you know, it's a tough one. And I don't know the answer to that one. I'm working my way up. You know, <laughs> try to really go, then do good analysis, then do good release planning. Now we got fixed price. Now we got other insurmountable problems, and I'm running out of career to fix them. <laughs> so somebody else has to do that. I'm tired. I'm tired. Okay. So, any questions? So, One, 12 seconds. Yes. So my question was is that in an ideal world, like you know, if you're working in a partnership with a government company, then getting yes. that requirements and analyzing them and story points is possible. But in, in government projects that I've worked on. They don't give you that much information. They give you a 10-page document or a 5-page document. Right. 
and you're asked to bid in it in 10 days, and everybody else is guessing numbers, and you know, you have to Well, the when, the last time this happened to me, last time before I started uh, coaching full-time, was in the late 90s, and we had, a, uh, we had to build an avionic system. We had a requirements document like this, it was our obvious garbage, from well, we front, to, front to back. <laughs> and so we just said, called up a three-star admiral, and, and said, send me a pilot. And they sent us two. There's always guys hanging around that are, they can't do anything because they got a bad back, or you know, they're, and uh, they, they'd love to come to LA for a year. So they sent two pilots to LA for a year, and we built a system. And it was a system that they could fly. We totally ignored the requirements. It didn't matter. And we ignored it in, in, as input. Of course, we adapted it every sprint to actually match what we were building. How did you bid on it when you before getting the Doesn't matter, we had a budget. You didn't have to bid on it. You had a budget. Your job is to, if your budget is big enough, you can almost always fit something inside that budget if you're actually. That will satisfy the requirements. See, that's, that's not an issue. Build me a car, you got $20,000. Okay, I can do that. You're not going to get the car you wanted, but you just said build me a car. Here's a car. But I think that misses the point of the fact that they also said bid on it. That's they right. Us, they, don't, they won't even tell you what their budget Yeah, range you went up to 20000 right. on one. And so this is where you get this is where you get the other issue. So the, the, the product, the product, that, the the bid had already been won. So of course nowadays it doesn't matter in the U.S. because almost everything is sold sort of fitting. So either you're picked to do it or you're not. Yeah. So I mean it's it's another issue. So bidding is not the issue right now. Well, I mean there's a lot of fixed price contracts that aren't like that in the private sector. The government's not the only one doing fixed price. That's right. And the private sector is a, is a long way from this. You notice that. That, 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 that the problem is going to solve it only applies to the U.S. military. The test it's going to be 10 years before it's out there. You know, unless you get enlightened clients. And I've had enlightened clients that understand this. But now you're in the enlightened clients thing, and that's not the problem. <laughs> that's Linda Rising's fault. She'd be the one who talks about this. Okay, any other questions? Okay. And I'm finished. Thank you.